and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself is a lifelong process, especially because we're constantly growing. Just when you think you've figured things out, you're not quite sure what you're after anymore. Sound familiar? Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding, because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way we do until we talk through things. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash chilling today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash chilling. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about prices paid and creepy countdowns. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Brandon Wills and S.M. Small are voice talents Ilithia Fay and Melissa Medina. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our Theater of the Minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by this is actually happening. It's the fall of 2017 in Rancho Tejama, California. A man and his wife are driving to a doctor's appointment when another car crashes into them, sending them flying off the road. Disoriented, they stumble out of the car only to hear dozens of gunshots whizzing past them, and it only goes downhill from there. This is just a chapter of a much larger nightmare unraveling in their small town. This Is Actually Happening is now releasing a special limited series called Point Blank, shining a light on the forgotten spree killings of Rancho Tejama. Back in 2017, a lone gunman opened fire on eight different locations in the span of only 25 minutes. Point Blank follows the stories of five people directly connected to the incident, from a father who drew the gunman away from a school to the shooter's own sister. It's a tragic story that quickly faded from public view, but Point Blank is bringing it back to the forefront where it deserves to be. 
Follow This Is Actually Happening wherever you listen to podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. Our first tale of the evening comes to us from author Lisselle Jones and is performed by Melissa Medina. Without further ado, I present to you Lone Worker. I arrived in the car park Monday, 7.29 a.m., taking one of the last remaining parking spaces, later than usual, as I'd stopped off for a triple-shot latte. It would be the highlight of my week. I looked out at the office block with its floor-to-ceiling lustered windows and sighed, grabbed my key fob, and trudged my way to another soul-crushing week. I work for a remote typing company. We specialize in medical transcripts received direct from consultants countrywide, which we transcribe and send to a central pool for proofreading before returning to the client. As exciting as it sounds, it was easy work most of the time. What you've heard about the medical profession's handwriting is, however, all true. Thankfully, I mostly transcribed from audio, which had the added benefit of not having to socialize with the rest of the department, or the pack, as I call them. The office was bustling already, the office manager Josie filling our in-trays with medical notes and any work that needed amending. She waved over to me. I nodded my thanks, made my way over to my desk, and switched on my computer to warm up. It was taking forever these days after the recent system upgrade. Not only did we now have security fobs to access every door in the building, effectively letting Josie know when we arrived, had lunch, went home in the evening, it even recorded when we used the restroom. We also had a new system on the computer letting us know how many people were currently in the building and logged onto the network. Each morning when I logged on, a message box would pop up saying you are staff member 200 and something to log on to the network. Today, I was number 238. As I opened my emails to start the day, the thought of that many people arriving before me when I'd arrived at the crack of dawn made me shudder. The day had gone by uneventfully, and I was getting ready to make my way home. The time between everyone else in my team leaving and me leaving could be anything between half an hour to two hours plus. I enjoyed the peace and quiet after everyone had left and usually got most of my billable work done during this time. I was about to log off when a message box flashed up on my screen. You are alone. I stared at it for a moment, not sure if I was looking at an email or an instant message. Then it dawned on me. It was the system letting me know that everyone had now logged off and gone home. Probably something to do with the new lone worker policy. I really should have listened properly during the mandatory training I wasted half a day on last month. Way to go, system. Let me know I have no life and make it sound creepy as hell, why don't you? I muttered to myself as I closed the pop-up and logged off. Tuesdays were one of the days I dreaded the most. Every week, the crazy ladies in the pack would all go out for lunchtime tacos to a nearby Mexican restaurant. They called them Taco Tuesdays. I told you they were crazy. Not only would they never invite me, they would also just presume that I would cover reception for two hours plus. If it was busy, that would mean I'd get half my usual workload done and would have to stay even later than usual. The glass theme continued throughout the building, so the reception area and receptionist only had a wall of glass between her and our office. There was, however, a handy sliding partition so we could cover for her when she wasn't around, which was often. This was a cause of conflict amongst the pack. If the intercom buzzed, everyone would stare angrily at each other trying to remember who had covered last. I mostly got away with it, partly due to being out of line of sight and partly due to not giving a crap. This particular Taco Tuesday, I was deeply engrossed in a report from a pediatric consultant when I heard the intercom buzz. Annoyed with the interruption, I quickly headed to the glass partition, ready to buzz through whoever was waiting to gain access from outside. As I walked over, though, I could see that there was nobody there. There was no way they could have moved away so quickly without me seeing them. Great, I thought. 
Now the intercom is faulty. <laughs> what kind of idiot contractors did they get in to do the job? I went back to my desk and sent a quick email to Richard in IT to report the issue. As an afterthought, I mentioned that the new system pop-up that said I was alone in the building was creepy, and could he please switch it off for me? Five minutes later, I heard someone moving around in the reception area and didn't have to look to know who it was. Hi, Richard, I called out before heading over. He kind of had a thing for me, so the quick response didn't surprise me. To be honest, I knew he'd sort out my IT issues quicker than any of his colleagues, wanting to impress me with his skills. He was kind of cute in a nerdy way. Hey, hey, Susan, thought I'd come down and have a look at your intercom problem. He smiled shyly, running his fingers through his dark, curly hair before starting to tinker with the intercom. Hey, I smiled back, making him blush. How's it looking? I really don't need the interruptions, especially when I'm covering by myself. He rolled his eyes. Ah, uh, yeah, Taco Tuesday. Well, I can't see any problems with it, to be honest, so I'll have the engineer out to have a look at it. Uh, sorry. It wasn't what I wanted to hear, but hey, never mind. The pack would be back soon, then it would be their problem. Richard was about to leave when he turned back to me. Oh, and the system message you mentioned, you are alone? Not sure what you mean. We don't have anything set up like that, but let me know if it happens again and I'll look into it. I gazed after him and began to doubt myself. Maybe I'd read the message wrong. I had been a little tired and stressed lately. Some of the reports from the children's hospital were particularly upsetting. Yeah, that was probably it. I was the last to leave again that day and was relieved to see that I didn't get another you are alone message. Throwing my bag onto the passenger seat and settling into my car, I adjusted the rearview mirror. I froze, gaping at where I'd stood a moment earlier. Crouching by the front door of the office block, there was a figure. It looked female, but that was all I could be sure of. Cloaked in darkness, her outline sizzled with something like electricity. She was bent over on all fours, distorted, flickering like a faulty light bulb. The air around me throbbed, amplifying the sizzling sounds until I felt sick and dizzy. Suddenly, the figure screeched and four sets of claws on spindly arms and legs flew out in my direction. I hit reverse and spanned the car around as the sizzling and screeching sounds became almost unbearably loud. As I got ready to speed away, my headlights illuminated the office entrance. The figure was gone. The sounds cut out, replaced by a thick silence, and I was overcome by a feeling of utter emptiness. I sat quaking until the sensation subsided, then drove home in a daze. I went straight to bed with one of the worst migraines I'd ever had, questioning my sanity until the early hours of the morning. I forced myself to go back there the next day. Having other people around would be comforting for once. I arrived amidst the drama of a total system failure. The IT department were baffled by it and advised us all to find non-computer work to do whilst they tried to fix it. This meant that management could retreat to the nearest drinking establishment for the duration. For us minions left behind, we were kind of stuck for something to do, given that our jobs are reliant on having a functioning computer system. I mean, I could have asked the pack if they needed any help, but they were pretty much in the same predicament as me. Plus, I knew they wouldn't help me out, so I took an unapproved early lunch and went to the grocery store nearby. I had a triple-shot latte whilst I was there and gave myself a good talking to. Obviously, I was stressed. More stressed than I'd realized. How else could I explain the events of the night before? I mean, what I saw wasn't real. It couldn't be. I was tired, stressed, conjuring up weird crap because a migraine was on its way. Yeah, that was probably it. Uncharacteristically, I bought muffins for the pack to make up for my lack of support and to smooth things over in case I needed help catching up. That plus I'd failed to bring anything in when I celebrated my 30th birthday earlier in the month. The tradition of having to bring cakes in on your own birthday felt like adding insult to injury and I hadn't bothered this year. 
30, still stuck in this boring job, virtually glued to a screen every week. That stress-induced hallucination was the most exciting interaction I'd had all week. When I got back to the entrance, I noticed that there were no lights on. With it being October, the lights were usually on pretty much all day. I went inside. All the desks were empty. All the computers turned off. Maybe everyone had decided to do the same thing as me and gone on long lunch breaks. I headed to my desk to check if anyone had left me a note. That's when I saw it. My computer was on, static interference crackling and buzzing all over its screen. I stared, transfixed. Then a message box shuttered up. You are not alone. My eyes darted around the room. All right, very funny, guys, I called out. Did Richard put you up to this? Even as I said it, I knew that wasn't what was happening. Richard wouldn't do anything to jeopardize his chances with me, as slim as they were. The pack didn't have the imagination, personality, or sense of humor to dream up such a prank. Scenarios started to run around my head. Maybe someone else in IT had set up the system message. Maybe it was remote from head office and IT didn't know. Maybe I really was going crazy. I was drawn back to the screen. The static started to intensify and I heard a scratching sound. It started from the front door, dragging across to the windows and then back again faster than humanly possible. Dark shadows moved from one side to the other, trailing the scratching sounds. They got louder and began to be accompanied by breathy, wailing screeches that made every window in the room shake. They got louder and louder until I thought my ears would explode. I knew then that I hadn't imagined the night before. She was back, the shadow now clearly her watching me from outside the window, waiting for me to make a move. I put my hands over my ears and screamed at the top of my voice. The computer went blank, and the noises stopped, her shadow gone. I waited a full hour before making a bolt for my car. It was as if nothing had happened, complete silence. She was gone, just like the night before. I seriously considered not going in on Thursday, but I wanted answers. Josie was kind of apologetic about not leaving me a note when she'd sent everyone home early the previous day, giving me a strange look when I tried to tell her what had been happening. You've been working hard lately, she intoned. Would you like me to refer you to occupational therapy? Perhaps you could talk through your issues with them? I didn't like the way she said issues. Richard was nowhere to be found. His colleagues had no idea what the static interference could be, and knew nothing about the system message. They suggested that I should turn the computer on and off if it happened again. As the day progressed, my unease grew and my courage retreated. I had no idea what I was going to do if she came back again. My only plan was to try to see her more clearly, see who or what I was dealing with, see if I could find a weakness or at the very least find out what she wanted from me. One by one, everyone left to go home, and I stared at my computer screen waiting for something to happen. An hour passed. It was now completely dark outside, and I was considering giving up and going home when a message box appeared on my screen, followed by another and another. You are not alone. I am watching you. I am waiting for you. Are you waiting for me? This time, the messages were accompanied by something else. A timer, counting down from 30. All my bravery and curiosity flew out of the window. I knew I had to get out. I grabbed my keys and phone and ran toward the front door, pausing briefly in fear of what was outside, but knowing I had to take the risk. I made my move and ran toward my car, cursing at having to park further away that day. My phone started to buzz. I turned to look at its screen. 29, 28, 27, 26. I whimpered and picked up speed. 
The breathy screeches from the previous night started up behind me. The sound of claws tapping against concrete in pursuit. I made it to my car without looking back. As I locked the door, scratching started on the windshield and windows. Dark shadows began to swirl round and round. I dropped my keys and scrabbled around for them before finally managing to start the car. I flew out of the car park on what felt like two wheels, but the shadow followed. It kept pace beside my car, scratching at the doors, trying to gain access or toy with me, I didn't know. The navigation system flicked to life, its blurry screen numbering exits that didn't exist. 25, 24, 23, 22, 21. As I joined the main road, I lost track of the shadow, billboards changing in front of me from weather warnings and speed checks to continue the countdown. 20, 19, 18, 17, 16. The car radio switched itself on, but instead of my usual channel, a distorted, cackling voice chilled me to the bone. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11. I finally reached my street and launched myself out of the car. I ran to my apartment, slamming the door shut behind me, checking my phone as I bolted it shut. The countdown had vanished. I didn't go back the next day or the week after. Three months had passed when I eventually decided to hand my notice in. By email, of course. There was no way I was going back there again. I claimed I was going to take a career break to go traveling. They either believed me or didn't care. I suspected the latter. The truth was, I'd taken some of my clients with me, contacting them directly to say I was now self-employed and would be happy to continue working for them, at a reduced rate, of course. It meant I could work from home. More years of my life spent stuck to a computer screen. The only person upset to see me leave had been Richard, and we arranged to meet up today for a coffee. He wanted to give me a good luck card and a box containing the possessions I'd left at the office. We'd agreed to keep in touch, but I knew we wouldn't. He didn't look at me the same way he used to. The shy glances were gone, and it sounded as if he'd be moving his crush on to someone from the accounts department. Back home, I settled on my sofa and opened the box, knowing the only thing in there I cared about was my iPad. I switched it on, ready for a relaxing night with my reading app. I gasped. The air around me throbbed and I heard loud scratching on my front door and windows. The iPad screen crackled and a pop-up message dominated the screen along with a timer. You're never alone. I was about to find out what happened when the countdown reached zero. I hope you enjoyed Lone Worker, as written by Lacelle Jones and performed by Melissa Medina. Lacelle Jones is a new author whose disturbing stories are influenced by dark encounters, mystical landscapes, and admin jobs. As a reminder, voice actress Melissa Medina's work can be found on the official Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel as well as her website, hearmelissa.com. That's H-E-A-R-M-E-L-I-S-S-A dot com. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by This Is Actually Happening. Good news, folks. Our favorite podcast, This Is Actually Happening, is back with a special limited series entitled Point Blank. This series takes us to the Rancho Tejama area of Northern California. After navigating a hard scrabble working class life, Troy McFadden finally settles down with his wife in rural California, when one day, driving down the road, they're aggressively T-boned by a stranger. They stumble out of the car only to realize they're under fire. 
What follows will change McFadden's life forever. This is only one chapter in a much larger nightmare unraveling in their small town. A lone gunman has opened fire on eight different locations in the span of only 25 minutes, shooting his girlfriend, then his neighbors, then going on a shooting spree. In the end, six people were dead, 18 were wounded, and lives were changed forever. In this series, you'll hear five unique perspectives of this tragedy from the people who were connected to it, including a father who drew the gunman away from the local school, to a woman whose grandson's father was killed in the attack, to the shooter's own sister. The first episodes are out, and they're profound and heart-wrenching. The detached stories you hear on the news can't compare to the accounts of those directly affected. They're the stories that deserve to be heard most, and I assure you, they'll stick with you long after you hear them. The first-person perspective in This Is Actually Happening is what makes it so captivating. And, since it's from Wondery, you know the production is on point. I'll most definitely be listening to the rest of the episodes of Point Blank, and I hope you'll join me. This Is Actually Happening is a weekly, first-person storytelling podcast hosted by Wit Misseldine. They feature extraordinary true stories that have dramatically altered the lives of ordinary people and are told to you by the very people who lived them. They're stories that sound like Hollywood movies, but I assure you folks, this is actually happening. Follow This Is Actually Happening wherever you listen to podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. Thanks for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. Our second tale of the evening is written by Brandon Wills and is performed by Elithia Fay. A woman is kidnapped by a psychopathic killer. She thankfully makes her escape, but at a price. Now, without further ado, I present to you the worst kind of monsters. That night was cold. The sticky afterstorm air clung to me like a wet rag and the fog started rising. I could see exactly where I needed to go. Behind me, I could hear the unmistakable sound of feet pounding on the pavement and the deep winded breathing of a desperate charge. He was surprisingly fast, but I was quicker and more desperate. He was an out of shape, overweight, middle aged man, and I was none of those things. By then, he had been chasing me for about a mile through the rugged woods. I also doubted that he could breathe very well through that modified pillowcase draped over his head. His eyes were probably bulging from exhaustion through the holes in the fabric. I hoped he would keel over dead from a massive heart attack, but luck wasn't on my side yet. I sprinted across the two-lane road toward a community that I could see from that hill over the tree line below. My leggings were in tatters from foliage grabbing onto my clothes, my shoes had been long missing, and I had stripped my muddy socks off probably a mile ago. My bare feet were aching and probably bleeding from running across forest debris and gravel, but I persevered. I didn't care about the pain. My life depended on escaping from this psychotic man. No matter what, he wasn't going to win. I was. He had been driving with me tied up in the trunk for hours, but I was carefully sawing at the extension cords he used for rope with a pocket knife. The trunk was utterly dark, so I had to navigate only by touch. The trunk had a pungent metallic odor that I realized was the smell of old, dried blood. There was also a small leak in the trunk, which happened to be dripping on my head, adding to the torture of this hell. The car was ancient, so it didn't have an escape button or hatch from the trunk. After what seemed like hours, the car had suddenly come to a stop. I heard the door slam shut and then heard his feet crunching on gravel as he marched toward the rear. The trunk popped open to reveal dusk had come and that the pillowcase psycho was back. Well, hello, beautiful. I just had to stop to get one last look. From hours of seething anger and the primal urge to survive, I leaped from the trunk, lunging for his face with that pocket knife. His eyes popped like a grape, exactly where I was aiming. 
Blood immediately began gushing from the wound. His face twisted in agony as he screamed a guttural roar of pain and fell to his knees. I thought about stabbing him again, or trying to beat the shit out of him, but last second, I decided he would probably win that battle. Every hour of jogging and running in the mornings had prepared me for this moment. Not knowing how much time that had given me, I sprinted for the woods. He soon followed. Hours later, I was sprinting for an unknown town through a dense patch of woods long before sunrise. It was nearly pitch black, except for little moonlight peeking between the clouds. Earlier that day, it had rained. Before all this chaos, I hadn't even considered how the rain could be a curse. The mud in this part of the woods was becoming thicker and deeper with every step. It soon became obvious that I had entered a swamp. Soon, I was up to my knees in water, then my waist. It had been a while since I'd seen or heard the man behind me. I hoped and prayed that he had given up on his pursuit. Thoughts began to form about what I would do when I finally made it to the town. Would I run to a house and bang on the front door, hoping that someone would answer? In the trunk, I discovered that he had taken my cell phone, wallet, and keys, but he still needed to check my jacket pocket, where he would have found that pocket knife. Now, it was my sole possession. I was swimming at this point. The water smelled putrid and dank, filling my nostrils with that gassy, unmistakable smell of a swamp. After calming myself and building up my nerve, I checked around again and did not see the man. He was gone. My spirits lifted and I chuckled with glee. That morning had started like any other. I'd wake up around sunrise, jog for a mile, shower, and then stop at Duncan to get an iced coffee before going to work. But something went horribly wrong this time. As I was jogging past a nearby park, I heard a car stop behind me down the block. The door opened and I could hear someone get out. This happens occasionally, and I usually try to ignore people. But this time, something didn't feel right, and I'd soon find out why. The next thing I remember, I'm waking up in the front seat of a car. My body showed obvious signs of being sexually assaulted, and I won't give you the vivid details. The back of my head was drenched in dried blood, along with a pounding headache. The car reeked of cigarettes, and the old upholstery was cracked in a million places. The man who owned this clearly didn't care much about it. I looked around to see if I could spot him. The car was parked in the woods somewhere. The car was parked by an old camper looking like it was older than my dad. The only path out was a set of ruts in the ground that led to what I assume was this horrible man's home. Not seeing the man, I decided to get out of the car, hastily make my way down this path, and see where it took me. My leggings had been ripped open at the crotch, and my knees were torn open from my falling to the ground. After making it to the top of a hill, I could see that the path led to a winding two-lane road, but I couldn't tell where I was. The cold morning air really reminded me of all this. That was when I heard feet pounding up the path behind me. I could see the man charging at me like a bull. The pillowcase over his head topped a large, hefty body capable of surprising speed. I bolted, praying that my morning jogs would give me endurance beyond his. I next remember waking up in his trunk, tied up like a hog heading out to be slaughtered. The water had become shallower after a few minutes. I examined myself and found that my body was covered in algae and mud and reeked of that awful smell. I trudged through the mud once again. The clouds had completely obscured the moon. It was so dark that I had to feel my way through the woods, making me move very slowly and carefully now. I could see the lights of the town through the foliage, partially guiding my way. I was almost running, but still trying to be careful. Lining the road to this town was some very thick foliage, so thick that the lights could barely peek through. I was making my way past them. Suddenly, I fell. I had fallen into a ditch covered by those plans. My knee had snapped and my ankle rolled. The fire and hot pain were shooting all through my body. Even the slightest twitch set it off. I was writhing and screaming in agony when I saw a car coming. Hey! I shouted. Stop! Please help! Waving my arms frantically while trying to bite back the pain. The car slowed and pulled to the curb nearby. Through the radiance, I could see a figure coming my way. I couldn't see the person because their brights were blinding me. I raised my arm to shield my eyes. It was him. The pillowcase was once again pulled over his head. I noticed a bloodstain streaming from the gaping wound where his eye had once been. His other eye glared at me with white-hot anger through the hole he cut in the fabric. I got you now, bitch! He gripped a tire iron. You're gonna pay for my eye! He barked through gritted teeth. 
What was I going to do against this gigantic man wielding a tire iron? He took a long arching swing at me, and I rolled. His weapon struck the ground with a ringing thud. Pocket knife in hand, I swing for his neck. I missed my intended mark and stabbed him in the back of his right ear. He bellowed in pain, grabbing for the wound, blood squirting out between his fingers. Fucking bitch! He swung again, connecting with my right shoulder. More pain. More ways to slow me down. The man wrestled me to the ground, trying to force the knife from my hand. My teeth crunched into the bones of his hand as hard as I could. The taste of his blood poured over my teeth, making me nauseous. He bellowed again. I yanked the pillowcase off in a fury and had the knife in my hand. This time, though, I took the opportunity to snatch the tire iron away from him and struck the top of his head with as much force as possible. He went out immediately, dropping to the ground. I don't know why I wanted to see his face, but something triggered deep down inside when it happened. All the memories of everything he did to me, the faces he probably made while he had his way with my unconscious body, and the sheer ugliness of this awful man made me snap. Something primal took over then. I'm not sure exactly how to describe it, but the memories of what he had done to me and what he had probably planned to do made me erupt in a blind rage. I gripped that tire iron so hard that my knuckles went white. I bashed his face so many times that it barely looked human when my rage was satisfied. His crooked teeth were now either fragmented or gone. His fat tomato nose was flattened into a mushy wound, and both eyes were popped now. His ugly, acne-scarred face was now bruised, busted open, and swollen. If he did manage to wake up, he'd be in for an even rougher time. I felt happy about it, but I'm still unsure how to process it. Should I be proud? Should I be ashamed? Or should I be afraid? I needed to get out of there in case he woke up. I searched through his pockets and found his car keys. I decided to also snatch his wallet so I could identify him. I found something else, too, that baffled me. In the same pocket as his wallet, I found what appeared to be a chunk of my hair. I felt around my head and realized that it was. After immense pain and effort, I dragged my useless leg over to the car and hauled myself into the driver's seat. The car rumbled to life, much to my joy. I turned the car around and drove. Luckily, I had injured my left leg, and this was an automatic shifter. This town was unknown to me, but I drove around until I found an officer. He tried to calm me down, but the words poured out of my mouth in such a fury that it just sounded like babbling. I must have been in sight, with mud and algae up to my stomach, clothes shredded, no shoes or socks, twigs in my hair, and the stink of swamp. The officer did his best to calm me down, and after a while, I managed to tell him the story. He took me down to the station and brought me a cup of coffee and a blanket. I remember thinking about how many showers it would take to clean off the swamp gunk and clean myself of the filthy memories from that evening. The police found him still unconscious by that ditch. He confessed to my assault and three murders, but DNA testing later pinpointed him to twelve others. All of them were around my age and looked strikingly like me. In his home, they found boxes of demented memorabilia like their underwear. He also collected snippets of their hair that he kept in the drawer next to his bed. You can probably guess why. What did I learn from all this? When I got home, I showered four times that day. I did this for days, never really feeling clean again. After the ordeal with the man, I never leave the house without my pistol, a can of mace on my keychain, and an overly paranoid vigilance of those around me. Sometimes I feel eyes watching me from behind, and I walk a little faster. I also bought a house and raised a German Shepherd puppy that I named Walter, who now joins me on my morning jogs. All of these things combined still don't make me feel completely safe. Then there are also the nightmares, in which he brutalizes me and finally kills me. There's no escape from those. Therapy helps, but how can you escape your own subconscious thoughts? But the one thing I really learned is that the worst kind of monsters aren't imaginary creatures in movies or books. They are other human beings. Sometimes, the worst people can bring the monster out of you, too. I hope you enjoyed The Worst Kind of Monsters, as written by Brandon Wills and voiced by Elithia Fay. Our beloved Elithia Fay's performances can be found here on our very own network. We're 
proud to have her with us. And since I'm plugging away here, be sure to check out the other shows we offer on our network. We have Horror Hill, airing Thursdays for your hardcore, more brutal offerings. Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Friday, featuring some southern down-home horror. Fear from the Heartland airs Wednesdays. Longtime resident Otis Jiry has a show on Sunday nights that features two stories on the Standard Edition, as well as two more which can be accessed through our patrons area. Now, our weekly Descent into the Depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself is quite the endeavor, isn't it? A lifelong process. Me, I'm more complicated than one of those scientific calculators. And if you think you're going to learn how to use one of those things on your own, I've got news for you. Either you've never used one, or I've got a job for you at Texas Instruments. So let's not kid ourselves. If you found yourself wondering, who am I, what are my unique challenges, and what do I really want to do with my life, then it sounds to me like you could use a counselor. Not just any counselor, but a licensed professional therapist from none other than BetterHelp Online Therapy. BetterHelp can help you better understand yourself and find your true life's path. And it's easier than ever to get started. Fill out a brief questionnaire on their website to help them get to know you, and you'll be matched with a licensed therapist who's perfect for your needs. Imagine the advantages you'll have with a personal therapist at your beck and call. Someone who understands you and stands ready to help with every difficult decision. It's a true boon to your everyday life. Here's why I personally love therapy. When we're on our own, our egos tend to make our decisions for us. Some ancient part of our psyches that doesn't like to think ahead. Mine tends to think mostly of fast food and beer, not very forward thinking at all. But with a therapist to be accountable to, there's always that reasonable, rational input in your life that helps you think things through. And with better help, it's never further than arm's length away. It's right there in your pocket. You can text your therapist anytime and get prompt, thoughtful responses. Every week, you can schedule video chats or phone calls, whichever you're more comfortable with. Either way, you're no longer on your own. All of this without the inconveniences of conventional therapy. And did I mention it's affordable? Since the whole thing is remote and online, the savings gets passed down to you. You get all the time-proven benefits of therapy without even setting foot in an office. Sounds great, doesn't it? There's a good reason 2.5 million people have used BetterHelp, and I hope you'll become one of them. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com chilling today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash chilling. Thanks for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. I'm your host of the evening, Steve Taylor and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark.
Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. (laughs) 